I guess we're ready then? Yeah, dude, let's freaking hang. What is this book? Night nice School. Cool. This book... Said it at the same time. Thank you for asking. This book is yeah. called The Crisis of Islam. So this book, the cover, the title sounds racist to me. The title sounds like a book that somebody who's anti-Islam wrote about Islam. You know what I mean? Yes, I do. And I thought the same thing. And I remember, because you and I were talking, we were talking about, uh, we were talking about the podcast and how we hadn't recorded in a bit mm -hmm. and how um, we had sort of been thinking that like we needed to be more open and like, let's not just do books, let's do other things. And so then like, but then we, with that freedom, uh, like, we had kind of given ourselves so much slack that we were hanging ourselves with it. Yeah, well said. And so we decided, let's just do books again. And then I looked down the shelf and, like, found a book that was uh, really, like, reasonably short. And I couldn't remember why exactly I had this book. And so I wasn't sure, like, when it says the crisis of Islam, is it saying, like, Islam's existence is a crisis? That's what, yeah, that's what it sounded like to me. Right. Um, and the reason I have this book, I, this is what I suspected it was, but the reason I have this book is you gave it to me. You gave it to me off of Jordan Peterson's list of like books that people should read. Mm -hmm. There's a, there's like a hundred of them or something on there. Mm -hmm. So I didn't remember that it was on there, but. Cause I was making, doing a prevailing wage job and I had a bunch of money and I was like, mm. I'm going to bless my brother for Christmas. Yeah. You gave me like, so I, 15 books or something like <laughs> yeah. that? Like a ton. But you know what sucks is that I was I went off of the list from Jordan Peterson's website that's like all books I recommend rather than yeah. books you need to read, which was actually the list that I wanted to get you. Mm. So I was like, I remember he had a list of like 20 books on there and I'm yeah. going to get Raleigh every single one. It's going to be like the Jordan Peterson themed collector set of books. It's going to be right. sick. I pulled up the list. It was like 100. I did the math. I was like, no. <laughs> Oh, so I was like, thinking about that's it. That's like fourteen hundred dollars. I was yeah. like, uh, I'll just like pick some from different subjects and getting kind of a variety pack. And uh, it's funny that I don't, I don't even remember picking this book or why I picked this book. Right. It was probably reasonably priced as well as reasonably <laughs> sized. Right. Probably that that other list. Yeah, you haven't read War and Peace, which is which just baffles me. <laughs> I got a War and Peace. Stuff. He hasn't read it yet. He says. You've read War and Peace, haven't you? No, I read the other one. Juice has read War and Peace. The other Tolstoy? Oh. Yeah, Anna Karenina. Mm hmm. Wait, so have, oh, wait, it's Dostoevsky, is that what you said? Or No, Tolstoy. Tolstoy, okay. I have The Kingdom of God is Within You by Tolstoy. That one's too long. All of his books are too long. Yeah. He had to... Spark, spark notes. I'm going to spark notes it. Yeah. So this book... Oh, and that other list, the shorter list, it's like not... There's like no link on his website to it anymore, but if you like go on a search engine and look up Jordan Peterson books. There's like two books. Everyone that should find. Yeah. Yeah. So that books, that list is out there too. But, um, so when I grabbed this book, I felt like, wait, is this going to be a problem? Like, is this going to be, uh, unreasonable either way? I guess. Mm -hmm. Like, is it going to be, is this going to be like an anti Muslim book? Just Muslim <laughs> bad. Nothing more Christian, nothing more cringe than, Two Americans, one agnostic, one Christian, talking about the problems with Islam. That is so <laughs> fucking cringe. Um, but what this is, when it says the crisis of Islam, what it's really saying is, like, here's the situation that Islam is in. Yeah. Here's And here's how they got there, and here's why uh, we see the problems that we do that stem from it. Because there is, there is a lot of, well, I don't know. Uh, relative to the amount of terrorism there is, a lot of it is uh, openly, like, Islam. Mm -hmm. like, because that's the root of the reason they do it. Um, and how did they get there? And I guess also more large, largely, like, uh, the Islam is a crisis for the world. It is, like, it is a problem. It's mm. a situation that we don't know because it's a tough thing to mix in with the rest of the world, I suppose. Mm. Um, but after reading some of like the blurbs at the front of it, it was clear that like it's not going to be a this is going to be a like a weird racist book. Mm -hmm. So Islam, Muslim people are inherently unintelligent. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. Um, <laughs> so um, I read this book. Uh, it took a couple weeks. And it was a couple weeks ago, so I reviewed it today. I was a little rusty on it. Um, and there's a few things that I, I learned. A lot of it, like, 
a lot of it, I guess, kind of reinforced some of the ideas that I have about them being like an extremely traditional society. That does seem mm-hmm. to be largely true. And I, I think a lot of it, it, it feels kind of um, like anti-technology, which mm-hmm. resonates with me a bit. Some wisdom in that. Yeah, yeah. Because they do, it does seem like a large portion of Islam considers the um, the Western world and the ways that we live to be, like, uh, in adversity to God. Yeah. Or in adversity to the way of God. Um, one thing, when I say Islam, I, I should get this out of the way. One thing that the, like, the first chapter of the book is about defining what Islam is, because Islam is not directly equivalent to Christianity in the mm. sense that it's not just a religion because it's a it's a religion but it's also like a nation like there was an area of mm. land at one point a huge area of land that they had control over that went like down into North Africa it went like into Europe almost into France uh so it covered a large portion of the world and so Islam or like the nation of Islam was kind of all of that and there's been wars since then like back and forth between different I guess like religious groups between Christianity and between Judaism and between Islam and there's been those wars so like the boundaries of that are hard to define but Islam is a religion but it's also political. It's also a nation. They consider it a country in its most pure mm-hmm. form. It's like a political system uh, and a set of beliefs. So it's it's sort of a, a broader thing than just a religion. And it's it's a really incomplete way when we discuss it as a religion. It is an incomplete way to discuss it because there is a lot more to it than that. Yeah, we take we uh, or I take separation of church and state so for granted that I I don't even think about a society working that way. Right. Where there's a belief system that manifests itself in the political and religious domain, and it's yeah one intact culture, which is which there's something admirable about. There is, yeah, and it it is like uh, something this book has made me feel is that like there's there is something admirable about that. But there is also something not admirable about mm-hmm. that. Like when when a when a Christian church gets too uh, fundamental, and you get like people that uh, interpret things in an aggressive way based on taking certain things too literally and looking away from other things, you get things like the um, I don't even uh, Westboro Baptist, the God hates fags guys, the guys mm-hmm. that would like show up at army funerals and say he's burning in hell, he's a fag, mm-hmm. like <laughs> that kind of shit happens. If you get sounds like a fucking episode of South Park, dude. That's so bonkers. <laughs> that was real. Um, so there is something admirable about like a, a people that are so hardcore and uncompromising about things. I guess. Um, mm-hmm. One thing that uh, one thing that stuck with me, I was going to say about the idea of it being like Islam being political. One quote, I, I think it was, I think it was from Muhammad, or it's from one of the. There's like a few books that they consider religious texts. Hmm. There, the Quran is something that was written by Muhammad, mm-hmm. and the there are a couple of other books too that are like more about Muhammad, but from the time mm. that he was alive, and that are considered almost as important as the Quran. So there are other books that are considered like religious texts. So I can't remember which book it was from, um, but someone so said. I have, I have a quick question about yeah. that because I wanna I'm I want to honor how Muslims think about their own religious texts. And, I, and I, I feel like saying that Muhammad wrote the text feels wrong because I think that they believe that Muhammad channeled the text. I believe that's From true. a higher yeah. being Yeah. that has a name that somehow translates to Gabriel. I don't know if it's the same being called Gabriel referred to in the Bible or how exactly that works, but I think they believe that Muhammad was a person pure of heart enough to channel a higher being that was delivering that stuff. I don't think they think right. of him as an author. Right. So did it touch, it touch on that at all? Uh, yeah, I think it did mention that, like, the idea is that the Quran was not, uh, it wasn't written by him in the sense that the ideas originated in his brain, but rather that they came to his brain from yeah. a higher thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it didn't, I didn't, I didn't hear anything about Gabriel. Um, I don't remember where I got that from. I'm, but I'm, I'm spitballing. I, I can't cite the source. It says right here. Okay, cool. Oh, it says it on the internet. 
Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> right there. There's the Archangel Gabriel. The Archangel Gabriel. What's the source on that? Is it legit? Uh, it's on Wikipedia. What, so it's probably, legit. honestly. Honestly. Good enough. Honestly, people tend to keep it pretty clean on there, so. Yeah. Um, but presumably it's from God, whether it came through Gabriel or from... Well, we know it came through Gabriel, but then it came through God, probably, mm-hmm. too. Um, where was I going? So... Well, you're talking about the text. There's a few other texts that are more about Muhammad. So yeah. there's a few texts that are religious in right. nature. Right. What I was going to say was uh, one quote that stuck with me <clears> was, uh, Islam is politics or it is nothing. Mm. And so uh, if I think it was from Muhammad that said that, but the idea being that like if you are not involving Islam in politics, then you are not taking Islam seriously enough because mm-hmm. Islam should be uh, everything. It should be everything. Um, Sharia law, that is basically like Islam turned law. Have, have you heard that term? Mm-hmm. Like people, only as a boogeyman. I don't know. Right. I don't know how gnarly it is, but only as a boogeyman to the West. Right. I heard the term. Yeah, that's mostly where I hear it in terms of like I hear it like in Fox News kind of context. Right. Like where they're worried that like Sharia law is going to be. I remember people saying that like Hillary Clinton wanted to put Sharia law in place, mm-hmm. which um, I don't know. Doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but uh, but the idea being that like Sharia law would be if all the rules from Islam were converted into uh, just straight up political government. Mm-hmm. Um, I, in, in, in regards to like Islam also being politics, the uh, Muhammad, after he had his revelations, it became like a big, Islam became a big political movement and he lived out like the last 10 years of his life in, in Mecca, which is where he like sort of founded the Church of Islam. Um, and it, like, it grew bigger and bigger from there. So it started as, like, a religious movement, but then it became, during his lifetime even, Mm -hmm. a more political force, a governmental force, and, like, a conquering force, and they started taking over places. And after his death, like, his, his, uh, what do you call people that come next? His, uh... Successors. Successors, that's the one, yeah. His successors, like, continued to expand that. Yeah. Um, so is that why it's... Because it's the fastest growing religion. It's growing slightly cl- faster than Christianity today. Is it really? As far as I know. Could you look that up on Wikipedia? It's growing <laughs> faster. Um, one thing... One That's thing what I've heard, but those are hard stats to get. That's it so is. subjective. It is. I typed it into Google and said Islam. So... It, so and, but that's no... Hmm. So, that's hard to... It's hard to say whether Christianity or Islam is growing faster because Christianity is so much looser than Islam. Like, right? If there's, yeah. if I mean, if someone out there is having uh, spiritual experiences that are of a Christian nature, you know, that change their way of doing things, they don't necessarily revolutionize their whole lives as much as they integrate those new revelations into their lives. Mm-hmm. Whereas Islam is something you you a hundred percent convert to right so christianity is so much more gray it's kind of hard to compare those but yeah but why are why do they spread so successfully uh were you gonna say something i think a lot of it is population growth that's what i was gonna say yeah oh so it, muslims are just reproducing yeah oh it, okay it did mention uh, one thing it talked about a bit was like the situation in the middle east is uh, a lot of it is that the birth rate is very high the birth rate is very high, and um, education rates are not good. Literacy is not good. Oh. Like, scientific uh, scientific studies are not big there. Mm-hmm. They're not yeah, well, uh, They're not really interested in that sort of progress, I suppose. It's, it seems like... It doesn't like, seem like progress to them. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's like... It's the fall, or something like that. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, the birth rate is very high there, and that's probably a lot of why it's growing so big. Okay. Yeah, because, like, I don't see, I don't ever hear of, uh, like, well, I guess, like, ISIS is kind of this, but I don't ever hear of, like, Muslim uh, missionaries right. like, being out spreading, being out spreading the good word about Muhammad. Mm-hmm. It's not really much of a thing. I've known a couple dudes who converted to Islam in jail because I think they... They had missed the boat on on uh, seeing Christianity as something that they were interested in participating in, 
but they craved that sort of uh, traditional culture to embed themselves in. And so mm-hmm. they saw Islam as another chance at joining a culture like that. That's sure. like that, that. So they found a spirituality and, and something a spirituality in it and found something grounding about it and found traditions and rituals. Mm-hmm. Um, Joey is one of them. I knew, knew at least one or two other dudes that weren't Islam. It, they weren't Muslim and then, and then were Muslim and, Hmm. Well, he's Middle Eastern, though, right? Mm, Am I wrong? No. Is he Mexican? I'm not positive. Mm. I'm not positive. I just assumed could he be. was Middle Eastern. Yeah, it could be. Yeah. But the two other dudes I knew that became Muslims weren't Middle Eastern either. Um, and they were also dudes from the street who didn't see a place in Christianity, but they wanted rituals, they wanted traditions, they wanted spirituality, they wanted rules to live by, yeah. they wanted a connection yeah, yeah. with God. And so they... Found it there. And yeah. So there's a, there's some of those, but yeah. But doesn't there's not people knocking on doors. Right. I, I have heard of people like can <laughs> I've heard of people joining ISIS. That's mm-hmm. what I hear. Which I suppose you could consider like conversion to Islam. Sure. It's a, a a little bit. Sure. But there are those that would say like the the book did discuss a bit that like, um, mo- it said most Muslims are not fundamentalists. And most fundamentalists are not terrorists. So, like, there is, like, degrees yeah. of separation. Like, although we do, it is, like, it does, Christianity, uh, in terms of, like, the way it is in America, at least, feels uh, probably like it is a lot looser than the sort of, like, strictness of Islam. But there's still mm-hmm. going to be a spectrum in there. It's going to be yeah. a spectrum of people that, like, do or do not take certain things Mm -hmm. seriously and people that interpret things in different ways Mm -hmm. um speaking of that uh jihad the the word jihad what that is is it gave a few words to kind of define it striving effort or struggle and jihad is something that is uplifted within the quran is encouraged and it says that like people that people that go out there like good muslims that follow the rules that go out and make effort to it's kind of vague but like those that go out there and do jihad for the glory of islam uh are more should expect more reward than those that follow all the rules but stay at home and don't go out there and get their hands dirty Mm -hmm. and it seems like a lot of people interpret that in different ways and like yeah jihad has gotten a bit of like a, a struggle or like uh like struggle has been kind of like a word that's been associated with it more and more and struggle so often turns into like people thinking about fighting although it wasn't explicit about fighting with that word there was like there was a lot of like Muhammad was waging war during his life to expand the nation. And so it's not a totally out of line assumption to think that like, maybe that is what you're supposed to do. Yeah. But that is a, that is a point of contention. I'm sure where like people have different interpretations of like what you're supposed to do with that. Yeah. And maybe some people interpret that as like, you need to go out there and just missionary evangelize the same way that so many Christians do. You need to get dirty. Like you need to go feed the homeless. Not like Mm -hmm. you need to go, Right. Kill the homeless if they're not Muslims. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, that shit's really tricky because I I want to believe that every religion is fundamentally good. And mm-hmm. I so badly want to see the absolute best in Islam. And the closest I can get to that is uh, reading and appreciating Sufi poetry by prophets like Rumi. Um, who are, they're writing the same shit that Christian, Hindu, and Buddhist m- mystics are writing. It's mm-hmm. just... Um, but I don't know if it's like an Uncle Iroh situation where it's like, yeah, there's a sage in there, but fundamentally they're doing they're they're completely out of control. You know what I mean? Like he's he's Fire Nation, but he's a sage anyway, and he's you know, he feels like the place that God has put him is there. Right. And he sees the issues with the Fire Nation, and but he himself is a sage. Yeah. If someone watching doesn't know this, I'm referring to a cartoon TV show called Avatar. Everyone knows. <laughs> they better. Yeah. Uh, but. Yeah, that shit's tricky that Muhammad was a warlord. That's like, because it's like, I mean, because you like look at all the stupid shit that Christians have done over the generations. It's like, yeah, but they're twisting something that was fundamentally good. Like Jesus did mm-hmm. not harm anybody. 
So, it's, you know, it's easy to say that. Or to say the same yeah. thing about the Hindu gurus like Gandhi um, or the million other ones with long names that I can't remember. Mm-hmm. They're just like, those people didn't do anything wrong to anybody. They just sat around and taught. Yeah. And then Muhammad is like, I really wish he wasn't a warlord. I really wish he hadn't killed thousands of people. That yeah. sucks. I don't know what to do about that. Yeah. It... Many of the lessons... I have not read the Quran. I know very little. I read this book and yeah. it wasn't all, you know, disclaimer. I don't yeah. really know what I'm talking about. But it does feel like uh, at its core, a lot of the ethical lessons from this are very similar in, and I think also good when compared with like Christianity and Judaism. Mm-hmm. Those, those are all very similar and they all have the same roots. They all have Abraham as the yeah. root. Um, yeah, I think you had told me this before, but it mentioned in here that like Islam acknowledges Jesus. Mm-hmm. Islam acknowledges Jesus as as a prophet. It acknowledges John the Baptist and Moses and Abraham and like many of the figures, the prophetic figures from the Bible, mm-hmm. and many prophetic figures that are recognized within Judaism that are not recognized by Christianity. I'm not hmm. sure how that works. I think there's like other so there's books figures who are Jewish and Muslim but not Christian in terms of like teachers. That is my understanding. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, that are considered like uh, canonical prophets. Interesting. Yeah, I've never heard that. So, which is so great because some Christians are like, "Fuck the Old Testament, it's the New, baby," and some Christians are mm-hmm. like, "The whole thing is the Word of God, every word." What do you mean the whole Bible is not the Word of God? Right. So that's so hard to define. Yeah, and there's I get that is um. That is another point where, like, there are disagreements among Christians. There are those that are super hardcore about every single rule in this book is the word of God. It is what it is. and we Well, should there's not, not a single it. person on the planet who's actually hardcore about every rule in the book. <laughs> probably. Yeah, well, I think it's probably impossible. Because right, they're right, right. Di- directly contradictory, directly contradicting rules. Yeah. Right. Um, Love your neighbor. Stone your neighbor. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? <laughs> what is it? Get stoned and love your neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, one thing, the uh, the book talked a lot about history in the Middle East and, um, and like, uh, the their relationship with the West and mm-hmm. uh, with America, more specifically. Um, it talked a lot about, like, America's relationship with Israel, how we have, like, a seemingly strategic relationship with Israel and and how much we help them out. And it paints a picture of, like, America's role in, it seems like in the author's opinion, but if not in the author's opinion, in the opinion of many people within Islam, that it looks like the United States wants to be, and other Western countries, too, want to be involved in the Middle East to the extent that it benefits us. And we don't, like, we don't, we aren't interested in actually changing, uh, if we have moral issue, we don't, we don't have real moral issues with any of the things that they do or with any of the ways that they treat each other, so long as it's secluded there and so long as it doesn't affect us so long as we can still get what we need out of them. And we also don't want them to uh, be united, basically. Like, mm. because there, is, there are forces within the Middle East, the, the Christians, Islam, and the Jews, that would like to have more control over the area. And there mm-hmm. are those that would, they're particularly, I think, these days, um, there are... Islamic extremists who would like to take the whole world over again or at least take over the old nation of Islam again uh, to restore that nation and it seems like we don't want there to be uh, even like an alliance among everyone there like we want to keep a fight going always in the Middle East because if it were all to combine if it were all to be under one ruler that wasn't us, then they would have significant power over us. Like, they may have more power than us because mm-hmm. of the resources that they have there. Mm-hmm. And so it seems like we do kind of poke our nose into their business there 
in an attempt to stir shit up because we don't want them united. And I thought that that was interesting because it makes me think of how I feel about what goes on here in our country. I think that there is a governing body that isn't exactly what it appears to be and that it doesn't that it wants to divide us mm -hmm. and that like the media is a big part of that a media is an arm of this thing that will say what it needs to say in order to keep us pointing the fingers at each other mm -hmm. instead of pointing the finger up mm -hmm. like i think that they the, the media you know props up things against that like to make people that are conservative inclined to dislike Democrats and to yeah. make people that are innately liberal uh, to dislike Republicans. And they want to keep that war going. They want there to be a constant 50-50 argument mm -hmm. between us. And we basically do 50-50 every four years. Yeah. And everybody feels like, man, my, my source is really telling it like it is because they're explaining exactly what's wrong with the other side. Yeah. They're just really telling it like it is. Yeah. So are we being that force... Are we as the Western world being that force to the divided nation of Islam? Yes. That we're just like... That's what he, that's what he proposes, or yeah. at least proposes that many people do think. That we are there mm -hmm. because we want resources, and we also need to make sure that they don't unify, and that they yeah. continue warring amongst each other and uh, mm -hmm. having beef with each other. Because if they didn't all have beef with each other they could be too powerful a force for us to deal with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. No good. What else? I learned about the Crusades a bit. Um, the Christian Crusades? The Christian Crusades, yeah. The Christian Crusades, It. I didn't know that their primary thing was that they were trying to get back where Jesus was born. That they like wanted to take back the birthplace of Jesus. I had no idea. But it, it seems like there is sort of a, um, a a series of, I think there's two different things. Um, Evan, are the Reconquest and the Crusades two different things? Um, yeah, but it, well... Like they're two different eras, two different... The Reconquest is, yeah, it's a different time. And it, that one took place in Spain. And the Crusades was in the Middle East. Right, because, yeah, it called it Reconquista at one point. Yeah, that, but that, that was... that was the Muslims had a big chunk of Spain and the Christian, Spanish, Christian... Right, they took... The, the When the Nation of Islam encompassed Spain and Portugal, yeah. so then the Reconquista was the Christians, or the Christian force kind of trying to take back their country. Yeah. But then the Crusades later were meant to go further than that, right? The Reconquista was kind of after. Oh, it was after? Yeah. Okay. Well, there's been a series of struggles mm -hmm. where the Christians and the Muslims, for the most part, have yeah. been taking things back and forth, <clears throat> and it's perceived as revenge, which is like, that's a tale as old the time. It's like, yeah. it's like gang shit, Bloods and Crips, like, no, these guys, you don't understand what they've done to us. <laughs> I think we should just let this stand. It's like... <laughs> it's been going forever. Right. You don't even remember how it started. Right. It's just it's just beef back and forth. What this book gave me a better grasp on is why there is such a an ongoing struggle there, I guess, in the Middle East. Why it is just constant wars. Because it is a lot like the gang shit. It's a lot like it's revenge back and forth. It's a revenge game. Nobody even knows how it started, but everybody mm -hmm. feels that they are acting in God's interest, which is a dangerous thing. Mm -hmm. It's it's that's dangerous if you're acting in, if you if somebody is acting in God's if they believe they're acting in God's interest and mm -hmm. maybe aren't I don't know they probably aren't both they can't both be yeah maybe one of them's right but probably neither. I is. talked to a uh, a Christian extremist from. What church was it? Bethel Church, who uh, <clears throat> was just kind of an odd kid who um, he joined the military, and I was talking to him at a fundraiser for Liberty Christian, and he said he was leaving for the military, and he was going to fight in the Middle East, and then uh, I can't remember how this came up exactly, but I, I was being a smartass because uh, 
It's like, fight in the Middle East. Like, fight what? <laughs> like, what are you even talking about? You know what yeah. I mean? And he's like, uh, uh, fight the nation of Islam because they are enemies of God. And he looked at me Man. with just absolute hatred in his eyes. And I was just like, oh, so you're just crazy. And like, you <laughs> Wow. Yeah. So that's ISIS. That's just, that's ISIS. That's an ISIS yeah. person. That's the Christian ISIS. Yeah. People but there's not the really military. a specific label on it because all you have to do is just like, well, I want to kill Middle Easterners. So I'm just going to just gonna join the military and hope I end up over there and hope yeah. I get to cap somebody. What makes the U.S. Army God. any different from the ISIS army? Like it's just the, the fact that they don't put labels, they don't put a separate label on the aspects of the military that are there to keep bases secure and just do standard right. shit and run security and make sure that the soldiers aren't getting drunk and just fucking do jobs and yeah. take care of the equipment and factories or whatever. And the people who joined it because they want to kill someone from a different religion, which this kid can't remember his name. I would just put him on blast. If I remembered his full name, I don't remember who the fuck he was, but mm -hmm. uh, he was there because he joined the military because he wanted to kill a Muslim. That's, that's what it was. Wild. I've never heard somebody like directly say that. You never been to a Christian conference and put the Christian sticker on. Then yeah. they get real comfy. Right. Yeah, it's ugly. I'm sure that the I'm sure that like military recruiters fucking love that when they like oh got a fucking religious zealot in here. Mm -hmm. like, yeah. Put this guy in the front line. He'll do it. Oh yeah, he'll, he'll do, do whatever. whatever. Women, children, he, they're enemies of God. So there is this sort of uh, religiously, divinely inspired. Thing going on, yeah, where everybody thinks that they are acting on God's behalf, right? But also on top of that, there are forces outside of the Middle East that want that to keep going and encourage that to keep going because it is more profitable <clears throat> for us. When I say us, I mean you and me personally. Just, <laughs> I mean, like the West. In order to... Uh, you and me indirectly. We don't have blood on our hands, okay? <laughs> our, our dads have blood on their hands. We're good. Yeah. yeah. The But uh, the, the, the West, it is more profitable for us if there's fighting going on there. And that's also... Do you have any more detailed description of how them fighting manifests as money for the West? Like, I don't understand how to connect those two things. If you... It's like... Um, it's we uh, we watched a documentary not that long ago. Um, it was that Alex Jones one where it was about like it was talking about like war and how like wars are made. There, I don't understand exactly the process of it, but there are ways in which if you back both sides, you are guaranteed profit. Mm -hmm. And there is also a benefit of like it is easier to govern. Uh, well, I don't know that it's easier to govern, but it's easier to... A divided populace can't rise up against a tyrant. Mm -hmm. And I guess it's that same kind of thing. That, like, we do have more power. The West has more power than the Middle East does. But that might not be the case. They could be a problem if they were all on the same team. Mm -hmm. And like that team wouldn't even matter what the team was, whether like Christianity or Islam took over, as long as it was all one force that was like acting on the same, acting on the same orders, mm -hmm. I guess. So it's more profitable because the chaos there makes it so that we can, we can control them more easily because they don't have, they're not united. Mm -hmm. Something like that. Mm hmm. And then also on top of that, the profiteering that's involved in, like, betting on multiple sides. Mm -hmm. And then when you see things start going one way or the other to make it keep going that way. And, like, mm. or give it to the other way. I don't I don't know all the all the ways the, that they do it. But yeah. it involves betting on both sides. Mm -hmm. Something like that. Uh, one other thing that I thought was interesting was that uh, at the time Muhammad was was uh, sort of rebelling, I guess, against the government. It was uh, it was like a pagan society at that time that he was like going up against. Mm -hmm. And I hadn't, I hadn't thought about that, but at that time it was a like a pagan government that he was living within. I thought that was interesting. 
Do you know anything about what kind of paganism? Like, I feel like the term paganism just means that the society was not monotheistic or united around a deity that everyone agreed was the ultimate. And so people were just kind of free to worship whatever they want. Just kind of yeah. like there's, there's not a god of whatever river or like just make up yeah. all kinds of different pantheon, a whole pantheon of different gods for different things. Right. Well, like the, the yeah. U.S. is like is pagan right now because if you ask different people what's life really about it's not like they all say the creator and being at union with the creator or the creator and serving the creator Mm -hmm. or or something like that they don't say like a unified answer one person says like oh it's all about kindness and another person oh it's all about justice and another person it's all about truth and it's like well there Mm -hmm. there is there is a place where those values overlap but there's certainly a place where they don't and so we're we're pagan right now there's not I guess I think of us traditionally as Christian because that is the predominant religion. I don't know what predominant. What percent of the U.S. is Christian? It might be less than fifty. Show me thirty-seven. Show me forty-nine. Says seventy percent. Bullshit. A lot of liars. Or <laughs> probably right who knows i mean people you ask people the, the religion question they're like yeah that's the thing the church there's they're the thing like maybe it would just count like i would even just count as a christian because of a christian background or something like like because i come from a christian you're culturally family. christian yeah that might be what that is right about 62 of those claim to be members of a church congregation huh no they're lying they're lying they go every Easter. Liars. yeah they're liars. They, but, they're uh, counting that. But still, but we're not, but we're not like a, we're not a nation like Islam that's united around a belief system or even united around like a way of life, uh, like a, a way to approach life. We're not a single even, one now. No, you, even if you ask like a Seventh Day Adventist, a Lutheran, and a Methodist and a Catholic, like what's it really about? They'd like, yeah. well, Jesus was really about like this or really about that. It, it's still. A, a, a society can be majority Christian and still be a fundamentally pagan society if everybody's theology is based more on things that they got from outside of church and things that they got from in church. Mm-hmm. And people choose, people pick, for example, do people more likely today, this isn't something we're going to be able to look up because it's a weird question I just made up. But do people decide what to believe politically because of their theology? Do people say, well, this is my theology, that informs my basic philosophy, and that informs the way to approach politics? Or do they have a political lean and decide to go to a church with other people who have that political lean? So is their religion from the church, or was their religion something they got before the church and they picked a church based on that anyway? So it's like, where, in what, in what order are we really setting our worldviews? I don't, you're I don't think that we're putting any unifying religious belief system at the top of the hierarchy when it comes to the way we order our worldviews. So, so that's what I mean by fundamentally pagan is like, I get what you're saying. You, if you ask a liberal, what it's all about, what life is about, what God is, is it kindness? And after, and if you ask a conservative, they say like truth, justice, or, you know, something like that. So, but anyway, like, do you, do you know anything about what kind of, like what exactly it means that Muhammad was living in a, pagan society because i i that word's kind of vague to me <laughs> yeah no and after i read it i felt like that wasn't as interesting as i thought it was um uh, but it just wasn't something i had thought about like what was the government that he was rising up again or what was the predominant religion of the time it yeah. was it seems like a uh i guess a vaguer thing and he was making things more solidified behind one idea, mm-hmm. but it, it didn't go into it didn't go into that anymore. And I didn't mm-hmm. study it anymore. Yeah, no. interesting. Yeah, interesting. Um, there are oh, this was there's one um, Quran verse that I wanted to share here, which I attempted to quote earlier. Uh, a good example is those of the believers who stay at home, other than the disabled are not equal to those who strive in the path of God with their goods and their persons. God has placed those who struggle with their goods and their persons on a higher level than those who stay at home. God has promised reward to all who believe, but he distinguishes those who fight above those who stay at home with a mighty reward. Well, that says fight. 
And that's interesting. I don't know if that's a translation. That's an interesting word. Um, but that does say fight. And also, just to just to try to honor it, what I do know about Muslim culture, which isn't much, that's not the Quran because it's not Arabic. The Quran is an Arabic yeah. book, so you you didn't just read a quote from the Quran according to a traditional Muslim. Mm -hmm. That's just us translating into, into into something else. So without knowing the culture and knowing the language and reading that term, we can't say, well, it says fight, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's really tricky. It is. Yeah. It might it might be just a bad translation? It, and yeah, like like you're saying, there's no way to you cannot translate something perfectly because mm -hmm. words words mean different things than they did yesterday, depending on the context that you're in. So yeah, perfect translation isn't possible. Yeah. Um. I did. But it is interesting that it's not saying like. It's not saying, like, God distinguishes those who put effort into going out into the world and doing good. Mm -hmm. It doesn't sound like it's saying that. It sounds like it's saying, like, go out there and do something. Yeah. It sounds like do something. Yeah. Like, when you're sitting around talking about, I, I don't think you're this extreme, but when I'm sitting around with Dad talking about corruption, and I'm like, what is there to do? You know, like, who's going to do something? Like, like mm -hmm. when are we going to get extreme is basically what it means. Like, at, at what point of government corruption is it justifiable to do something violent and honoring to the forefathers and all of that mm -hmm. to, to take to violent protest? Obviously, liberals and conservatives are both having those conversations right now. Sure. But it, it does kind of sound like that tone. Like, go out there and do something about it. Yeah. It, it, it also made me think of uh, the way that that story was... Or not a story, but the way that that was written, it made me think of... I can't remember, like, the source of this, but it's in the Bible, and you and I and Dad have talked about it before, but there's that thing where, like, a guy comes, and he gives, like, three servants a certain amount of money, or maybe it's God, explicitly, that gives, like, a certain... No, it's a parable. The parable of the talents. You get one, you get five, you get ten. Okay, you tell it. You tell it. You'll know it better. Well, a talent was some unit of money at the time. Uh-huh. But it's really funny that the word talent means ability now because that's often the way that it's translated. It's like, sure. if you have abilities, use them. Yeah. Um, yeah, give, give somebody one unit of money, one five and one ten. The one with ten does more, multiplies. The one with five at least like holds onto it. And the one with one is so insecure that they only have one that they just like, bury it and don't do anything. And right. so the master or an investor in the story is like, you multiplied it all, you're great, you know, you hey at least you at least you hold on to it or doubled it or you or you did something right and then the other one who just like hid it away and was like all I have is this he's like you didn't do anything with it like fuck yeah. you yeah basically um, so like it doesn't matter how much you have but you need to do something with what you have no it's a, it's a more brutal story than that because Jesus also taught um, a law, it's, a, it's now an economics law called Matthew's Law because of the Bible verse that described it so long ago that says to those who have, more will be given, and to those who have little, all will be taken. Yeah. And it does mean, like, that momentum multiplies upon itself so that when you start winning, you start winning more, and they just stack up. Mm -hmm. And if you don't do anything, you just melt away so quickly. But people who have less ability and less to, to work with are way more likely to just slip into the cracks yeah. than uh, than people who have a lot. So it's kind of a fucking brutal verse that's just like, here's the law, here's how shit goes. You know, if you have a lot, it's easy to turn it into more. Money makes money. If you don't have much, it's easy to, for it to turn into nothing. But the parable also says, like, that, I mean, if you're, but if you're somebody who doesn't have a lot to work with, say somebody who's listening to this who's not creative or attractive or intelligent or... Or anything, and they're just like, the fuck am I supposed to do with my life? Which is a fair question. Mm -hmm. It's like, if you could hear that parable, you'd be like, hey, I'm the one talent guy, but you know what? I'm going to go out there and do something with my one talent anyway. Yeah. So you can still read the story in an optimistic way, but it's a brutal story. Sure. Um, yeah, I guess it reminded me of that. And um, there are a lot of like similarities in terms of like the lessons that those two religions teach, and I'm sure Islam or uh, uh, Judaism teaches as well. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't really have anything else. Uh, does there any thoughts you wanted to share? Or mm -mm. I'd like to read the Quran. Be cool. Well, that would be cool. I want to have read every every religious text. I need to do it. I haven't even finished the Bible, let alone That's anyone tough. else's Bible. It's tough. It's not fun reading. It's not light stuff. No, it's like it's it's uh, th yeah. There's nothing light 
there's nothing light about it. It's either revolutionarily positive and I'm weeping reading it or I'm uncomfortable or I'm annoyed or I'm bored. I mean, it's always something. It's never just reading. Yeah. There's so much to it. But I feel like the more I release like religious attachment to it, the more I can actually enjoy it and get out of it. Right. Christians create such a barrier to the book by being like, this is God's word and it, every word is going to transform you and, con- and and condemn you and convict you and inspire you. And when I just read it like, ah, oh, this is a weird old book of wisdom that yeah, I might lore. as well read. Like this yeah. is, this should be like just viewed as studying lore. It At least that's be. how, well, I don't know. I, I don't, I wouldn't say necessarily should be, but that's how I feel like I would best look at something like that yeah be like looking at it as lore right that that that's our kind of religion is like let's just treat these texts like something that there's something to learn from because there's i mean people people read harry potter and and internalize ideas that jk rowling wrote in there that are brilliant and useful and then they and then they end up living out those ideas because they've internalized them even if that idea has happened subconsciously um like I'm working on a blog post about the the golden snitch and the cross. So the golden snitch was the there's this game. That if you get the golden Quidditch. snitch, you win the whole game. And so yeah, Quidditch. Yeah. So uh, there's a million rules in the Bible, but Jesus said that there was one very short list of rules that encompass all other rules. If you do those, you win the whole game, which is love God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your strength, um, or body, mind, and soul. My yogi ass would read it. And then uh, love all other people and love God as you love yourself. So they're both three part. Mm-hmm. One of them seems horizontal in nature, as in love all people okay. and love God as you love yourself. And one of them is vertical in nature, as in love God with all of your being. Align yourself completely with God and see everything else with the unconditional love of God. And so that's the horizontal love and the vertical love, which is the cross. So that's one other way to read the symbolism of the cross. So I'm writing a blog post about that right now called The uh, the, Golden, the Golden Snitch and the Cross. But um, people could read Harry Potter, and they're not trying to read it for a religious reason. Mm-hmm. But they read that about The Golden Snitch, and they subconsciously realize, oh, sometimes there's layers of game where there's one game that you could win, but there's also another thing that you could do where if you do that, you win the whole game anyway. Like, yeah. I, like uh, uh, rappers, for example. Like, I, I've put a lot of time as a rapper into trying to rap better. But then when I spent more time working on my character, I I realized, oh, that's a higher game. Like if my character is yeah, yeah. better, I write better and perform better and feel more confident recording because I know what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. So working on my character is a way higher level game than like looking up how to write lyrics better, like the mechanics of lyrics, like right. higher game. Then like, well, what game is even higher than that? Like, well, there is a higher game than trying to get better character, which is surrendering everything to the creator like that's a way higher game um and and so then it's like well what's the highest game and then i end up in what i consider to be true prayer and true meditation which is just being and then everything coming into place from that but anyway like you could read harry potter and you could that golden snitch thing could get you thinking like that you weren't reading it for religious reasons but then like reading the bible is so intimidating because there's so much baggage attached to it that you can't just get into the story and then just subconsciously internalize the things that you learned from it and organically become a better person because of what you internalized from it. Cause you're so busy being like, Oh God, the creator of the universe says I'm a bad person. Cause I do this or that. And it's just like, there's so much pressure attached to it. it just makes it fucking exhausting to even read. Sure. And, uh, it's kind of a benefit to reading, uh, scriptures from other culture, like the Quran or the, the scripture, the only scripture I've read, the whole thing in Tao Te Ching, because it's short, but there's no baggage attached to the Tao Te Ching. I'm just reading an old book of wisdom. Right. So you don't, like, have to take it as seriously. No, I don't. Yeah. I can just learn from it. Right. Like, like what a concept. Like, from something that was fiction. Mm-hmm. But, as Jordan Peterson said, like, if you took a bunch of, if you took, like, the ten best fiction books ever, they basically would be religious. Because they would oh, resonate yeah. with people for a reason. Right. Because the right. lessons in them are important. Right. Yeah. And that that's that's what those figures, those religious figures are. People that said something. And this is something that's fucking tricky to me about Muhammad. Like, the shit that Gandhi said, the shit that Jesus said, the shit that Buddha said, mm-hmm. resonated so deeply that people took it and went, look! And they just passed it on. And they passed it on and it just, 
in every direction because they go, this is a gem. This is a gem. This is a gem. This is a gem. And everybody just passes it along and just mm-hmm. people blow up about it. Um, to play devil's advocate with the Christian example, there's plenty of crooked things that plenty of Christians have done to promote Christianity. It's not pure, you know, but fundamentally those people, I'm so fascinated by those religious figures because their words were so powerful that people got so obsessed with them that they exploded into movements that said, why don't we try basing our whole society around what this dude said? Like this would work. Yeah. Um, but then with Muhammad, it's something else. It's, he said, listen or else follow me and I'll give you power. Let's go kill people and make them do like do things the way that we want them to do it. It's like, fuck man, what do I do with that? That's so uncomfortable. Yeah. It's not just that the Quran was so inspiring that people pass it on and pass it on. It's it also that he himself, the center prophet of the whole tradition, was like, let's go fuck shit up and make everybody get on board with this. It's like, wow, that sucks. Yeah. I wish that That's wasn't the way that it happened. And and it's it still... I don't want to close the possibility that it could be a fundamentally good belief system. I feel um, like a lot of it is. It mm-hmm. feels like it is to me. And the, the way the book presented... Islam, it didn't, it presented it in a, in a nice way, I guess, Mm -hmm. like that it's not, it's not a horrible thing. Although there are a lot of ways that you can interpret it that, uh, can be horrible. But, but let's say, let's say that Islam is a false religion created by the devil to distract people from uniting with the creator. Um, if that were the case, then 99% of Islam would sound great, but it would have just enough lies in there that it prevented you from really reuniting with God. Like if you want to, if you want to manipulate somebody, you don't do it by telling them all lies. You Mm -hmm. do it by telling them 90% true things, but then the things that you want them to believe that aren't true, you can slip in there and they're like, this guy always tells me the truth. And that's how you slip in the lies there. If you want to manipulate someone and ruin their life, that's how you would do it. Yeah. So that is what the devil would do. Um, so it's like, just because most things in Islam are good, doesn't mean that Islam is fundamentally good. Sure. Like the most fundamental thing about Islam is Muhammad. So it's like, what the fuck do I do with this? Like, I totally see how the Christians um, would largely look at this religion and just go like, no, this guy, this guy wasn't about spreading love in such an infectious way that it became, that it multiplied exponentially. Yeah. This guy, this was fundamentally a power move. Yeah. You don't have to dig deep to get there. Ah, that sucks. I wish it wasn't. I wish it wasn't. And I'm also not close off to the possibility that Buddha, Jesus, and Gandhi were way worse and more flawed people than the scriptures led on, but that the people followed them and then distilled out of what they saw from those people the best parts of them and passed that forward. And that's the real symbol, not who the person actually was, but the greatest hits albums that people made based on those people. And that's the real symbol. And so it's a combination of a great man and the exaggerations about that great man's character that other people made after the fact, and that uh, Muhammad didn't have as good oppressed people as as the as Jesus, Buddha, and Gandhi and those other cats. I know I know Gandhi had some dirt in his life. I don't remember the details, but uh, maybe maybe the Buddha did. Maybe Jesus did. Maybe you know. Maybe they were all. Maybe maybe they all had fucking twenty wives and were banging everybody and being douchebags and. And it, but it was Probably. so long ago that we've just like, oh, no, let's just focus on the good parts because we need a symbol. So we're going to make right. up the rest. But Muhammad was, was what, 200 years more recent than Jesus? I think it was around 500. You got that? He was, he was alive 600 AD. 600 AD. So, so maybe Jesus, uh, and Buddha was 500 years before Jesus. So maybe Buddha and Jesus were just old enough that their dirt could all get erased historically. But Muhammad was just recent enough that we all still know, like this guy was banging children and, and hanging people like what the mm-hmm. fuck. Um, and Gandhi was recent enough that we know he was cheating on his wife or whatever the hell he was doing. And so we're like, Oh, these people are pieces of shit too. But like maybe everybody was, and yeah, we erased it. So I don't know. I'm open to everything. Yeah. I don't know. I don't think I have a whole lot more to add. No. Let's, uh, let's wrap this up. But, um, yeah, it was uh, kind of a cool read. Learned a little mm-hmm. bit about Islam, which is uh, something I didn't know much about at all. Mm-hmm. And Yeah, I'm really glad to have gotten this little introduction as to how it functions. Sure. 
Cool. And if I got anything wrong, I'm sorry. Right. Yeah. Please comment. Please let us know. We sure. want to know that we fucked something up. Yeah. We're looking for truth. Night school. Night school.